Okay, what? Oh, I figured I have the Zoom pulled up. I should be popping up to you. Okay. Um, hey, Dory. Um, and then if you want to go ahead and make Dory and me a co-host. Yeah, I wasn't sure how early you wanted me on. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, Maddie is going to make you a co-host. And then um, if you want to test screen sharing. Sure. Okay. Oh, yep. Yeah, looks like it's working. Good. Oh, yep. Yeah, that's perfect. Excellent. Yay. How are you? How are, how are, how have things been? Good. Busy. Crazy. Why are there not enough hours in the day? But it's good. That's good. How you guys been? It, how's the weather there? Is it warm? Yeah, it's not too bad. It, it was cold last week. This week it's in like the 60s. High 60s, that's kind of perfect. I went for a run the other day and I was like, this is actually like perfect running weather, which we never have out here. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Although I don't know about the nice part about running, but okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'm running if if I'm running, something's chasing me. That's fair. That's fair. How many, um, how many people do you have registered for this? Awesome. We yeah. have 97 people registered, um, <laughs> which I think is going to be I have I have it pulled up on a second computer for the, the breakout room. So I was just turning off the video over on that one because I could see myself in two places. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you yeah, know, ones and I only ones is all I need. Yeah. Um. But I'm going to be in Florida, not near where you live, but my sister's bachelorette is going to be at the beach in Florida on the Gulf Coast. Oh, the Gulf. Yeah, that's like several, like, that's a good seven, eight hours for me. It's far. Well, yeah. I guess where in the Gulf Coast? Like, are you going, like, Florida, Alabama? We're going to someplace called um, Rosemary Beach. That, that sounds like it's very... Um, like Northwest Florida. Yeah, it's cool. It's driving distance from Atlanta. Mm, okay. Six hour drive from Atlanta. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. When so will that be? Maybe you're in Echo Woods, but not really. <laughs> no. Once, when is that? Last weekend of March. Okay, and when's she getting married? April 15th, tax day. Ooh, okay. Very romantic. That's extremely romantic. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they will never, they'll never forget it. No, no. They'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah. It'll be an easy, easy anniversary to remember. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's in Atlanta? Yeah, it's in Atlanta. Yay. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. That's How's, uh, what sport does your daughter play? Softball. So the season Softball. started um and it's her their first like we just got the schedule well this is actually like kind of a preseason thing that he just threw out there and I kind of don't want to miss it yeah so, no I don't blame you that's more too. important I appreciate your flexibility so oh wait let me show you look how cool this is oh if I bust through it this is can you see it? If I put it in front of me, wait. Hold on. No, the screen thing is blocking it out. How about now? Oh, I yeah. oh yeah, I can see it now. That's beautiful. So it's I hate these things. There's a way to do it where you can <laughs> whatever. Anyway, it's a music box, and when you pull it, it plays the hakikva. And this was playing this was hanging in my grandparents' home. Um, hi, Robert. I'm Dory. Nice to meet you. Hi. And I was telling you, like, when I was, when I was putting the art in the presentation, I was like, looks so familiar. And it's been hanging in my daughter's room for, since she was a baby. That's amazing. You need to show that to 
to everyone on the web. But unfortunately, I have to stop my background and then you see my room, my office, because I can't figure out. Oh, there we go. That kind of works. There you go. That kind of works. That's awesome. Okay, cool. I, I kept it here in my room, in my office to show, but you know, these backgrounds are weird like that. That's, that's like honestly an incredible story. I know. I know. I was really excited about it. And then, you know, I, I looked really closely. I was like, okay, is this Arthur? Sh it, it is. Like I, I actually took a picture of the name of the artist because it's so tiny down at the bottom. And like I zoomed in. I'm like, yep, it is. <laughs> it's just such a cool connection. Well, it is such it a also cool. kind of goes to show like, uh, I feel like for students, it would be really cool to show too, because I think a lot of times, you know, they see art from history or primary sources from history, and it's hard for them to understand so that it would be in the real world. And they're in, yeah. Yeah. This somewhere outside of a museum or some sort of collection or, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So it's like something that, you know, they have in their house might be. <laughs> Right. He analyzed my middle middle school students later in life. <laughs> well, I can't wait actually to tell my daughter about it. Um, my older daughter who's out away at school, but I'm like, guess what? Oh my god, it's so cool! And it's like everyone's starting to enter the waiting room. That's exciting. Yeah. And then uh, I didn't introduce you guys. Rob works with me. He's my other half at work. Um, so he does everything I do, but for STEM teachers. He's oh. actually leaving this week, though. <laughs> His last day is Friday. Um, and then Rob, this is Dory. She works for the ICS, and we've done a couple of these webinars together now. Yeah. Um, and then she knows some of my my peeps back at KSU. Mm -hmm. Where are you headed, Rob? Uh, the National Science Teaching Association. It, where is that located? Well, they're, they're selling their buildings, so everybody works virtual now. Oh. So it's the National Organization for Science Teaching. So it doesn't, you, can, you don't have to move then? Nope, it's awesome. I'm Great. really looking forward to it. Congratulations. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry for the museum, and I guess that's more on your shoulders, huh, Isabel? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they'll, they'll fill it his position soon, you know. Uh, but and then Francesco, hi. Um Hello, hi. 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 Uh so Francesco, this is um my uh partner Dory. Uh she works at the ICS uh Institute for Curriculum Services. So she'll be giving the master educator session uh right before your talk. Um and then we have Rob uh Wallace on the call as well. He's one of my colleagues who's gonna be helping. With the breakout rooms later on um and uh before we started though i did want to um confirm with you how to pronounce your last name is it <laughs> spagnolo it's actually spagnolo so spagnolo. it's like a like like in like a new sound like in in spanish it means spanish and italian to my you know to make my life more interesting <laughs> yeah spagnolo. but yeah so sp spagnolo 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 that's very good well done it doesn't matter in the end yeah. Will be and then and we, feel free uh, to refer to me as Francesco if that works. Um, and then Maddie did make yeah. you a co-host. So if you want to practice, um, I just wanted to see whether I can uh, just share my screen that everything works well, so yes. that we don't have any surprises. So just a second, I need to start the presentation. So just one sec, and here we are. So let's see. And we'll just try maybe a slide with audio. This is just the sound of people coming in, right? This, this, this. Yes. Okay. They're right. in the, the waiting room. Okay. So let me just see about sharing screen. Just a sec. Uh, okay. Let's see. You see, you see a presentation? Yeah. Yes. Okay, let me just quickly go through like a slide that has some 
maybe a video of this one just to make sure it works. Yes, it works. Would the animation work? And I just wanted to see something that has sound, so bear with me for a second. Oh yeah, no worries. Okay. And or you'll see we're using a similar case study. Let me just get to it. Of course, it's at the other end of the whole thing. So just a second. Oh, we really are. That's okay. it. And okay. Here, I think we're getting close to one of these. Yeah, just to make sure that it works. Yeah. Oh, good, right? Mm hmm Okay. So I think I'm set. Yeah, you can go ahead and, and let everyone in. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our teacher webinar for this month. Uh, we're going to wait just a couple more minutes uh, on uh, a few more participants to see uh, who else is going to come on through, uh, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone who just popped in. Uh, thank you guys for coming to the webinar. We're going to wait just a couple more minutes as people start to uh, slowly come into the webinar. Awesome. So I think there might be a few more people trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to uh, put my slides up um, and, you know, welcome everyone for, for coming and joining us today. My name is Isabel Mann, and I'm the teacher programs and curriculum specialist here at the National World War II Museum. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, so this is a Zoom meeting, which means that uh, we can see everyone and we can also hear you if you are unmuted. Um, so just as we start the presentation and all of that, um, just make sure that um, you are muted so that we can hear both of our uh, wonderful presenters for today. Um, and then towards the end of the webinar, we will do breakout rooms where you can talk with other teachers and the breakout room leaders. Um, so at that point you can unmute, but while we uh, do the first half of the webinar with our speakers and presenters, just make sure that you stay on mute. Um, and so today we are going to dive into the art and life of Arthur Schick um, and specifically how to incorporate his artwork as primary sources in the classroom. And so really our agenda for today is we're going to watch a quick introduction video uh, to give a little bit of inf information about the exhibit that inspired this webinar. Then we're going to hear from a master educator about some teaching strategies um, for <clears throat> uh, how to use his artwork in the classroom. And then we're going to get to hear from a curator um, who curated the exhibit currently on display at the museum uh, to really do a deep dive into his artwork and Arthur Schick's life. Um, and so to get started, I do want to play um, 
just a short video um, about the exhibit that inspired this webinar. Right? Uh, so currently we have a special exhibit on display called In Real Times, Arthur Schick, Art and Human Rights, uh, which was curated uh, by the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and so before we dive into the bulk of this virtual workshop, we wanted to share with you a little bit about this exhibit. Um, currently on display at the museum with a short video from our Associate Vice President of Collections and Exhibit, um, Aaron Clancy. Uh, and so, uh, Maddie, if you can go ahead and start that video. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Clancy, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Collections and Exhibits at the National World War II Museum. Today, I have the pleasure of giving you a look at one of the museum's special exhibitions, In Real Times, Arthur Schick, Art and Human Rights, located in the Brown Foundation Gallery. In Real Times was developed by the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at the University of California at Berkeley and it examines the work of artist, illustrator, and political cartoonist, Arthur Schick. Born into a Polish Jewish family, Arthur Schick was a refugee who settled in the United States in 1940, where he created artwork as a miniature artist and political cartoonist. This special exhibition displays over 50 original works of art from the Toby family Arthur Schick collection. These works of art are showcased across six main themes of the exhibition, human rights and their collapse, the rights of global refugees, the right to resist, the rights of nationhood, the right to expose tyrants at work, and the right to America. Exploring this exhibit, you will also find two interactive workstations where visitors can explore Schick's work of art in high resolution. Additionally, visitors can remix and repurpose individual elements from these works to create new cartoons at these workstations. Visitor work is projected on the exhibition's walls and can be instantly published online sharing visitors' interpretations of Schick's art to a larger audience in real time. Bringing Schick's artwork from this exhibit into the classroom gives students the opportunity to cultivate critical thinking, socio-emotional, and media literacy skills. During this teacher webinar, you will take a deep dive into the life and art of Arthur Schick, as well as learn about practical strategies to effectively incorporate his artwork in the classroom to build needed student skills. We hope you enjoy the webinar and find the resources presented to be useful for you and your students. Awesome. So that just gives you a little bit uh, of a sense of what the exhibit looks like here at the museum and some of the art that's highlighted um, in that exhibit space. Um, and Erin Clancy is great. She couldn't join us in person today, um, but she is here in spirit via video um, with us just to give us a sneak peek of that exhibit uh, on display here currently. Uh, and so with that, we're gonna go ahead and move into our master educator presentation. Uh, so I have the awesome uh, honor of introducing you all to Dory Gerber. Uh, Dory Gerber is the Southern Region, Region Trainer and Educator at the Institute for Curriculum Services. Uh, and today she's gonna go through with us some teaching strategies for helping students critically analyze art as a primary source. Um, and then following her presentation, we'll get to hear from uh, Francesco Spagnola, um, who uh, helped to curate that exhibit currently on display at the museum. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to Dory so she can uh, switch our screen shares and go ahead and start her presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, good afternoon to all of you. It is a pleasure to be here with you all, to share in this learning experience with you all. Um, so as, as was shared, um, we're going to kind of start our program off with some practical um, and pedagogical strategies for analyzing primary sources um, in general, and uh, more specifically using art as primary sources, and even more specifically using Arthur Schick's art um, as primary sources. Um, and so with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. As Isabel said, my name is Dory Gerber and I am an educator with the Institute for Curriculum Services. I do wanna just share a little bit about who ICS is with you and what we do. Uh, we are a nonprofit education initiative. We're based in San Francisco, California, but as the Southern Region Educator, I get to zoom in with you all from Orlando, Florida. Um, so again, hope, hope everyone is having a wonderful evening so far and, and welcome you all here. So the mission of ICS, the Institute for Curriculum Services, 
is that we're dedicated to improving the quality of education in regards to topics related to Jews, Judaism, Jewish history, and Israel. And we do that by taking a look at what are the standards nationally uh, when it comes to these topics, how those standards trickle down uh, statewide to different uh, state scope and sequences, develop resources that are free and accessible, as well as provide professional development to support educators on these topics to help uh, in, with instruction on those, on those topics. Ultimately, we believe an excellent education is what is essential to, to building a strong civil society where all people can flourish. And we are very proud to be consortium members of the Library of Congress's Teaching with Primary Sources program. I will highlight some of the Library of Congress's tools um, in our conversation this, this evening. Just really quickly, the graphic you see here just shows all the topics that we offer our free curriculum uh, and professional development in, the blue being the subheads in the social studies um, under the social studies umbrella, the maroon being these specific topics themselves. We are currently, and I'm just gonna drop a, a link in the chat box, currently running a cohort on, an online cohort on teaching the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, a self-paced online course with some blended interactive um, elements. And you can see all the wonderful uh, benefits of taking part in that particular program there on the screen. Do hope to see some of you join us as, as students enrolled in the, in the course. It takes about 10, 10 hours to complete. All right, during our short and, and abbreviated time together, we're going to really just kind of uh, unpack what primary sources are and their importance to learning. We'll take a look at some specific tools from the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and other areas that can support your instruction with primary sources. We'll, there'll be some interactive components and, and elements to this presentation where you'll get to act like a student. Uh, because again, one of the best ways to know how to implement with our students is to, to practice and, and model opportunities. And I'll be providing you with some resources and also uh, Isabel will be providing you with some at the end of the session as well. Um, but that, that's what we'll be covering in our, in our time together. I want to start really quickly with an activity. I told you there'd be some interactive elements. So we're going to start with an activity that's going to have you think about your daily life in a critical way, in an analytical way, and maybe in a way that you haven't really done before. Um, and the objective behind this is to help us understand how what we do as individuals each and every day can be used as evidence to be preserved for the future, right? So we ourselves can be primary sources. So let's go ahead and um, I'm gonna drop another link in the chat box. This is to a Padlet. If you're not familiar with Padlet, it's one of my most favorite um, educational tools. Uh, you can use it for tremendous amount of collaborative learning with your students. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to grab that link out of the chat box, or if you prefer to use your phone, you can grab the QR code that you see there on the screen, and it's gonna take you to the Padlet. And we're gonna do this column by column, um, one at a time. We'll do it kind of quickly, but we're still gonna do it one at a time. So hopefully you're, you're joining me in this Padlet. Again, the link is in the chat box. For those of you that are in, what I'd like for you to do is go to this first column, because what we're doing is, is we're starting really broad all the way out here, and we're gonna list all of the activities that you have done in the last 24 hours. So grab this little plus sign, click on it, add all the, the things that you've done, make a list, you know, five, 10 things that you've done in the last 24 hours, and hit submit, and we'll take a look at one of some of the things that um, all of us have been doing over the last 24 hours. We'll take just a few moments to have you all participate in that. Let's start to see the let list populate. As you're grabbing that uh, link in the chat box and uh, you're clicking the plus sign, you're listing all of the activities 
or at least a few, right? Give us a sampling, maybe three to five. We'll, we'll go for that. Let's do three to five things that you've done the last 24 hours. You've done PD at school. Uh, there's some curriculum writing, watch TV, um, painted the molding, completed the tax return, traveled on an airplane. Okay, excellent. I love seeing this list. And one of the cool things about Padlet, if you're not familiar, is you can scroll through to see what your students have put in there. Uh, they can scroll to see what each other have, has put in there. Comment on that if that's a setting that you allow. Great. Let's move to the next column. So we're going to we're going to narrow in a little bit our focus, okay? So of those activities that you just listed, is there any evidence that they would leave behind to prove that they actually happened, right? So someone said that they completed a tax return. There's going to be evidence of that, right? The the whether it was a um a a digital filing or a paper filing, um Perhaps there was evidence of uh, the dishes in the sink from when dinner or breakfast was made, um, caught up on world events. So maybe there was some, some browser history if you looked for the news online. Oh, so, okay, so someone finished a costume. There was a video showing this per person participating in PD. Um, lessons, yep. The room that's painted, absolutely, the refund. Awesome, if you get a refund, you're, congratulations, awesome. All right, so you see what we're doing here. We went very broad, we're narrowing it down. Now I wanna go even further. Okay, I wanna narrow it down a little more. Of that evidence that you think could be used to prove that the events actually happened, which of those could be preserved for the future, okay? And with your students, you really wanna hone in on the why. But for the, our, our purposes and the sake of time, we'll, we'll just kind of list um, the things that could technically be preserved for the future, right? The grades for students, right? Um, the, perhaps for their, their college entries, their transcripts, things like that, right? Units and lesson plans to show what was being taught in, in, you know, in the particular subject area at a particular time. Um, for sure, the future school plays could use those costumes. Absolutely. Pictures. Yeah, great. Excellent. Um, a student writing example. Wonderful. <laughs> the refund saved in your bank account. Hopefully that will be preserved for the future and not spent right away, right? Uh, and the paint. Let's hope that would last several years. Excellent. Now, but building on that evidence that could be preserved for the future. What could a future historian be able to tell about your life or the society in which you live based on that evidence? What could a future historian be able to tell about your life? I bet many of you are going to say they can tell that I was a teacher, right? You attended lesson plans, you or attended PDs, you wrote lesson plans, but you were very busy. Um, maybe they can tell that um, that you supported your students by going to PD, yeah. Maybe that your your um, communication or you lived in a very tech-centered world. Um, oh, okay, excellent, love it. That art allows someone to travel the world. Oh, your Goodreads history, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that your the teacher read a lot of books, I love that. Okay, great, so we really narrowed it down. And now I wanna ask a, specific content uh, question. In your own words, what makes something a primary source? In your own words, what makes something a primary source? Let's see what you come up with and let's see if there are any common themes in you. Okay, firsthand by the participant, right? See if there are any common themes. I witnessed Okay, firsthand and see that again. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So many of you are referring to that firsthand experience as something, um, making something a primary source. Excellent. All right, so well done. Thank you for participating in that. Now I've got a question for you. How do you think that activity can help your students understand the value or the functionality of learning with primary sources? What would, what would be the benefit in your opinion of doing that activity with your students? Go ahead and add your thoughts to the chat box.
what might be the benefits of doing that activity with your students? As you share in the chat box, so some things to consider, right? It allows, um, yeah, that their life is creating primary sources, deeper thinking, it's hands-on, right? Um, guide your students in the direction you want or help them to understand that um, it's relatable, that, that what they're studying is relatable, right? Oh, I love that primary sources aren't always uh, from famous people. Yeah, there you go, Jeffrey, it's related. It's, it's relatable. Um, it becomes personal. Uh, they they get a sense of of skin in the game, buy in as they're learning. It gets them involved, right? Exactly. I love that, Gabriella. Excellent. Thank you all for sharing. So I want to just talk about um, some research and how research and education stresses that the use of primary sources in the K through twelve classroom has a tremendous amount of learning benefits, which include expanding students' world knowledge, offers opportunities for interdisciplinary learning, increased student engagement, develops critical thinking skills. Here you go again, I'm putting you on the spot again. Tell me what you think are some of the best benefits for teaching with primary sources. Why do you like using them with your students? Besides the fact that it says so in your, your standards, right? What, what's, what's some of your favorite reasons? And as you're, you're adding that, I'll, I'll mention that the studies also recognize that making meaning from primary sources is, is challenging. And students need clear guidance and they need practice in working with different types of primary sources. And we'll show you some strategies and some tools that can help with that practice. Okay, so students can feel or view history. Yes, they can experience it. They can almost... I like saying that that primary sources are like having a time machine that students can go back and 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 live that time period of history, right? They they it's more than just documents. It's more than just text. It can be artifacts. It can be images. It can be um, uh, songs. It can be lyrics, right? I love that. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And I agree with so many of the things that you were saying. So we'll wrap up our, our kind of conversation here about what primary sources are. This is a definition that comes from the Library of Congress. I think that this is an excellent um, working definition that you can use with your students, whether it's a poster in your room, on your, on your uh, learning management system, website, whatever. But primary sources are the raw materials of history, original documents and objects that were created at the time under study. They are different than secondary sources or accounts that retell, analyze, or interpret events, usually at a distance of time or place. And there might need to be some vocabulary development there. What does at a distance of time or place mean, depending on the level of your student? But those, those, those two definitions of what primary sources are in comparison to secondary sources are really very helpful. So let's go ahead and, and dig into the tools for support. So really quickly, let me ask this question um, and you can reply why for yes and for no. I am familiar with the Library of Congress's Teaching with Primary Sources tool. I am familiar with the Library of Congress's tool. Okay, some of you are, many of you not, and that's great, okay. so. The Library of Congress offers a treasure trove of resources for teachers, especially if you're looking for primary sources specifically on global historical topics during the 19th, uh, 20th centuries. And um, it's interesting that there is some really interesting uh, historical information about the Library of Congress. I actually encourage you to take a virtual field trip there if you're not able to visit it yourself. It's one of the most beautiful buildings in DC, um, and it was in 1812, actually, when the first uh, catalog was published, but it wasn't until 1994 until it was actually digitized. But I digress a little bit because I wanna get into the tools. Um, what I'm gonna show you here, and this is actually another 
neat interactive tool. This is called a thing link. It takes an image and it makes it interactive by putting widgets over it. Um, and what I just want to point out are a couple of things. The classroom materials here um, specifically, and where you can look here and see if there are any complete source sets on subjects that you are teaching. Also, you may find complete lesson plans and multimedia presentations um, on the website as well. Now, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, which we'll talk about in a minute as well, has, as I mentioned, a treasure trove, thousands and thousands of, of resources, primary sources, which just like the internet, you can get lost in the web of resources, right? So I wanna teach you something that is a really cool tool. It's a formula that allows you to search the library's website, but uses Google to do so, okay? So what do I mean by that? So there is a formula. Let me go back to this image here. You see this right here. The formula is topic, whatever topic it is, then the word site, colon loc.gov. And I'll go ahead and put that in the chat box for you. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that, okay? So I'm gonna search for Arthur Schick in Google, right? And watch what happens. Every result is from the Library of Congress. So what we are seeing in this Google result is every entry that the Library of Congress has on Arthur Schick, right? So there's a good, uh, some benefits to this, right? So one, um, it's a way for you to kind of already create a catalog of resources for your students, or it allows you the, gives them the autonomy of doing some searching online, with you having the peace of mind that they're looking in the right places, right? Okay, so I wanted to just show that tool to you. I think it's a really um, beneficial formula, if you will, okay? Now, I want to show you, We I've mentioned to you how research shows that students need a lot of practice with different types of primary sources. Well, how do they get the practice with it? Well, the Library of Congress, the National Archives as well, has created source analysis tools to help you with that. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say you and your students were going to analyze a map. So if you go to this link that you'll have access to, you will find um, a variety of different types of sources, right? Books, charts, manuscripts, maps that we're gonna look at in a minute, movies, newspapers, so on and so forth. You can see all the varieties of, of types of primary sources that you and your students might interact with. Here are maps. So if we click here, here's what you find. This becomes a planning document. I can make this a little larger for you. This becomes a planning document that utilizes the library strategy of observe, reflect, and question. And we're gonna practice this in just a minute. And you'll notice the planning document here has prompts that your students can use to interact with the source itself. And one of the other things I like to point out is how it offers um, opportunities for students to different to do activities on their, you know, that is that are differentiated to their levels of learning. Okay. Um, also, one of the cool things is that they have created an opportunity for these um, these source prompts to be fillable, right? So you can provide this to your students, uh, maybe a copy of the prompts, they can complete it right in here. Cause like I always, I always like to say, y'all have way too many things to do to, than to decipher students' handwriting at this time. So give them the, the, the um, prompts, allow them to respond on here. They can email it to you or upload it to your learning management system, however you receive information from your students. Um, and I do want to one, one more thing. If you are using a source that is not listed here, this one I call the generic set of questions. This right here, the analyzing primary sources, the first one here is kind of a generic set that will work with any type of primary source. But let's go ahead and practice, okay? This is one of Arthur Schick's um, images. 
And I believe Francesca is going to use this in more detail in a little bit. But I want to take an opportunity to just use some language with you that I would use with students. Um, observing is actually one of the hardest things for teachers to do, right? Because when we look at something, we are automatically using our prior knowledge and our con and the context to make references, reflections, connections. Students don't necessarily have that. So we really wanna teach them the art of observation. Really quickly, this is uh, one of Arthur's works um, from 1943. It's called De Profundis. Uh, and it says, the text in there says, Cain, where is Abel thy brother? Okay. Um, and you can see at the bottom here, it says, that it uses Bible imagery to depict the slaughter of European Jews. Now, here's what I'm, why I'm telling you all this, right? If I was doing this with students, I might not share this source information right away. With you all, I want we want you all to know where this information is coming from, but I might not share it with students right away because I want to, I don't want to, I want them to have the opportunity to just do what I call an eye walk. Let their eyes walk all over the image and I'm gonna put it in the chat box for you as well so that you can look at it maybe a little bit larger on your own device. Um, but what I'd like for you to do is take a moment to eye walk the image, okay? I know it's a little small here, but I'll take give you just 30 seconds or so. I walk that image. Um, oops, I realized it didn't get sent. Here we go, sorry about that. And Isabel, if you want to just give me a, a heads up in the chat box about how many more minutes I have, I want to make sure I get through everything. Really quickly, now that you have an opportunity to just kind of eye walk over the image, using some of the prompts from the Library of Congress's planning documents, tell me what you see. Don't make any connections. What do you see? What stands out at you? What are your literal observations? Right? Go ahead and add. So one thing that stands out to you when you look at that image and add it to the chat box. Go ahead and add it to the chat box. What's one thing that pops out at you? Is it the, um, the, the script? Ah, right. It's very intricate. There's a lot of fine details. It's hand drawn, maybe, is something that might be noticed. There are people on top of each other, right? There's Hebrew, right? There seems to be broken, a broken um, wall. It looks like there's a, a, a village in the background, right? Excellent. Now, it seems that now let's make a connection here. I, I know someone put in there despair, right? Um, let's reflect on that, right? Why do we think this image was made? And now maybe this is an opportunity to give the date of this image to your student. Then they can maybe connect the date, what was happening at that time period of history that would have Arthur Schick create this image, okay? Um, and who was his intended audience for this image? and more in detail, right? Someone mentioned about the, the despair, okay? Why might there be so much despair? Why are these bodies all uh, on top of each other? What does, right? Uh, and now we're gonna get to the, the next part, which is questioning. And I'm going super, super quickly here, simply because I want to make sure you see all the different tools, but you would want to take a lot more time to go through each of these steps with your students. And I do want to point out, if you remember, that that, that that formula that the library uses is in a circle because this is not linear. You don't just go from observe to reflect to question and be done with it. It can be ongoing, okay? So keep that in mind when you're working on that with your students. But a question that comes to mind to me is, what does de profundis mean? Right. If I didn't know that, if I were a student coming into this, I would want to know what does that mean, and what is the connection, and and why would Arthur Schick put that in this image? Why is he referring to Abel? Right. We're 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 having a biblical reference here. What is the biblical reference to this image? So on and so forth. 
okay? So that's one example of using art. Now, this is another phenomenal tool for analyzing art, uh, specifically printed images. It could be political cartoons, uh, anything like that. And it's called the zoom in strategy. So let me show you what I mean by using one of Arthur's um, pieces of art. Okay. So we do this in a Google form and you will have access to this. So what I've done is I've taken a screenshot of a portion of one of Arthur's art pieces. Okay. And using very similar strategy of observe, reflect, and question. I'm asking questions in that vein. So what details do you notice? What issues do you think this cartoon is about? And who do you think the people are in the image? So students are having to use their observation skills. They're having to make some connections and they are questioning. you looking at this portion of the image. Then when we go to the next part of it, there's another part of the image, okay? And we're asking students again, observing, describe what you see. Let's make some connections, right? Who are those two figures? What's significant about their clothing? What do their facial expressions show? So we're really asking them to dig deep into these, these figures here. And then what, when do you think this was taking place? And why do you think that? Right? We need our students to provide evidence to their thinking. What is What can they use to back up their thought process? Okay. And then lastly, I'm showing the entire image. So we zoomed in on parts of it. Now, again, depending on how big your image is or what parts you want to focus on, what questions you want to ask, can be how you, you snip your, your little snippets, right? But um, now you can see the entire image. We have the um, caption, which is to be shot as dangerous enemies of the Third Reich. These are the dangerous enemies. So once your students have the caption, they have the entire image to look at and take their small observations and inferences to make a bigger, greater picture. I've got a couple more minutes and we will wrap up this part of the pedagogical tool. We talked a lot about the Library of Co uh, Congress. I wanna also highlight the National Archives that have very similar uh, resources, but specifically for a little more narrowly focused on historical resources, specifically to American history, okay? But just like the Library of Congress, they offer a variety of source analysis tools. I'll quickly, quickly show you, just like the Library of Congress um, has, they use a very different strategy, which is to meet the document. I should say, this really should say meet the source because they're all different types of sources. Observe its parts, try to make sense of it, use it in historical evidence. One thing I really wanna highlight though, that I, I think they do really, really well is that they differentiate the types of, of, of questioning based on the level of learner, okay? Really quickly, I'll show you. So photographs, this is for younger, maybe your ELL students, or maybe your elementary, early middle school age, right? So it's, it's much more visual um, for, for those students. And whereas this one is much more um, text dependent. Okay, so similar, you'll be able to analyze the same thing with all of your students, but give them the source, uh, way, the way to analyze them based on their level of learning. Uh, oops, really quickly, they also have the same, you can do the same, the same formula, and I'll put that in the chat box for you, the same formula. Grab that, and put it in here, and I'll just show you really quickly what I mean by that. Here is that same formula, but now we're gonna use the archives. And again, every result comes from the National Archives. And these are all of the things that the National, all, all of the primary sources that the National Archives has on Arthur Schiff, okay? Really quickly, these are some more uh, sites that you can 
get primary sources from or to help with the analysis of primary sources. These are all linked in my sessions resources. Think outside of the box when working with students. I love this opportunity for using primary sources, especially art, right? As finding um, different viewpoints uh, and, and from the perspective maybe of Arthur Schick, maybe of the community he was creating the art for. Um, those are some viewpoints that you can look at. See, think, wonder, and think, pair, share are excellent strategies that you may already be familiar with, but they're excellent for analyzing art. Um, again, really work on having your students practice the observation skill and take those observations and make the connections based on their level of learning, their instruction that you are providing on those topics. Uh, I love Think, Pair, Share specifically because it gives the independent, the student the independent uh, time to really think and then take, and so they're not just think, not just using someone else's thoughts, but they themselves are thinking and then have to share with someone else and then they have to share with a greater group. Make, uh, be creative. We utilize in some of our lessons activities with educators to uh, speak the language that your students are speaking. That's social media. Have them interact with these images by creating tweets or Instagram posts about them. Make your favorite worksheets fillable. Make your life easier. Make them Google Forms, fillable PDFs. Don't carry home stacks of paper anymore. One of the cool things about Google Forms you saw, embed images right into, into them and have your students complete them. You'll get their responses in real time know who completed it, know who's really on target, know who needs support. And that brings us to the resources. So let me go ahead and put that in the chat box, which I know also that at the end, Isabel will be providing you all with the link, but I want to um, say thank you to you all for being such amazing participants in this uh, portion of the program. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the program. There's so much more Francesco has in store. And I know that um, the folks at the museum have in store for you as well. So thank you so much. Every time I, I hear you present, I learn I learn new strategy um, to use with you know teachers and students. So it's always so great to have you have you uh, contribute to our programs. Um, and so all of the all of our slides and all of the resources Dory shared, um, I'll share at the end of the session and also in a follow up email with you all as well. So don't worry if you didn't catch everything, um, you'll have opportunities to to grab those resources and slides um, at the end of this webinar and from the follow up email as well. Uh, and so with that, we're going to move on to the next portion of our program. So with Dory, we started big putting our teacher hats on and really thinking about some teaching strategies. And now we're gonna narrow it down to our topic at hand and hear from a content expert. Um, and so I have the privilege to introduce you to uh, one of the curators of uh, the exhibit that's currently on display here at the museum in real times, Francesco Spagnolo. Um, he is the curator of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life as well as an associate adjunct professor in the Department of Music and the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and he's really going to do a deep dive into the exhibit we currently have on display, as well as the life and work of Arthur Schick. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Dory. This was really a wonderful presentation, a great way to, to start. Let me see if I can you know, the usual choreography, I, I will have to share my screen before I can actually say anything. So just bear with me and let's make sure that everything works. And uh, so hopefully you see a screen that says in real times. And if you do, we're in a good, in a good place. Uh, so actually uh, in, 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 uh, in several ways, uh, what I'm about to present is very connected to what we just heard because uh, this exhibition, was, which I curated, is, is part of the curatorial practice and research practice of the Magnus at UC Berkeley. And um, pretty much everything I'm going to discuss has been discussed with, tested, researched with students. 
So in some ways, what, what the exhibition is, is also the result of education, teaching, and, and very much thinking and doing things uh, together collaboratively. And um, the, the, let's say the educational part of, of this process involves uh, sort of fostering uh, what can be called 21st century competencies, such as critical thinking, media literacy, emotional intelligence, creativity, as in sheer creativity, how can we make new things? And uh, finally, and in some ways, I encourage to go back to the last slides in, in, in Dory's presentation about the, the, the various forms and, and worksheets, and uh, not just make them uh, available so they can be filled out, but make those uh, collaborative. Uh, and and uh, let's say, encourage your students to think together, to think on their feet, and to borrow from the title of this exhibition, to think in real time together. And um, so this is an exhibition that, as you heard at the beginning, is organized and divided. So when you visit the gallery, or you also you can view a lot of, a lot of it online, uh, but it's, it's uh, divided according to a few chapters. I'm just gonna list them, and then I'm going to really dive into some case studies. Uh, but uh, a broader chapter and the introductory chapter is called Human Rights and Their Collapse. And that is very much because the, the exhibition is a reflection on a slice of history. Uh, pretty much all of the works on display, the over 50 original artworks on, on display, uh, date from the second quarter of the 20th century. And we're talking about a time in which many artists, not just in Europe, but had to jump into not just be artists anymore, but also to take a stand and, and to use and sometimes weaponize their, their art in order to, uh, to achieve political results. And, and sometimes uh, not just political, but really geopolitical uh, results. And so uh, the idea is that this project is, is situated squarely at that time. Um, and also uh, one of the rights that are explored by, by through the works of Arthur Schick is, are the rights of global refugees. Uh, Arthur Schick was a refugee himself, as we heard. And, um, and his work is situated across uh, what are the, especially in the interwar period, the, the greatest refugee crisis before, before the, current, the current one. Um, so a lot of what we are thinking through this exhibition is actually uh, learning uh, hard learned lessons from, from, from the past and, and thinking about human rights and civil rights as something that is not just there, but something that can also be revoked and something that has been, has to be fought for. Um, so uh, other chapters in the exhibition include resistance, the topic of resistance with almost like real time snapshots of uh, various figures that during World War II uh, were on the resistance front and opposing uh, the Nazi and fascist regimes across, across Europe. Um, there is also an important chapter in this project that has to do with nationhood and uh, probably those who have been refugees or even just immigrants uh, uh, get to appreciate the value and the importance of nationhood as an umbrella under which human rights can be granted. And this is one of the deep lessons of the early 20th century about who falls under the umbrella, which humans fall, fall under the umbrella of human rights and, and which humans do not, and how nationhood is instrumental toward, toward that. And then a, a right that's very clear in, in, in the work of artists, the right to expose, the right to expose tyrants, to expose crimes, the right to, to not just to speak, but to speak up and to speak truth to power. And finally, and in some ways, the whole narrative of the exhibition is bracketed around this. And, uh, and here I brought my own immigrant experience, I guess, to, 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 to this project as an immigrant to this country, but it's the right to America. And um, there seems to be a concerns that brackets uh, uh, Arthur Schick's uh, production with America, a passion for America, and also concern for America and, and the state of the civil rights. So that's very much part, a, a way in which the whole project can be bracketed. But just to, uh, to remind you, um, the real times that we're discussing today are both the real times of Arthur Schick's life and work, so the progressive unraveling of European democracy and the painstaking restoration of human rights in the first half of the 20th century. And that continue, these are real times that continue to be very real to this day, as we all know, just by browsing through the news cycle any day of the year. Schick's concern were in line with those of many of his peers. He was an, even though he has a fairly 
idiosyncratic uh, aesthetics to his work. He, he has a lot of companions. And so especially East European Jews who were who deeply understood the nexus between minority rights and global human rights in the wake of the First World War and during and after immediately after the Holocaust. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but essentially that, that context in which Arthur Schick uh, grows up intellectually is, is essential to, to his outlook and uh, and very big part in the narrative of this exhibition. Well, unique in his aesthetic outlook, Schick had many companions in his journey, even though he did not meet all of them personally. And the exhibition highlights a few also through, and I will bring in through some uh, not primary sources, but walk, but quotes and and references to to other uh, thinkers, artists, and 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 uh, women and men of action. So among them is the historian Emanuel Ringerboom, who um, painstakingly collected and documented and created an archive that was then buried and therefore salvaged uh, during the 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 Warsaw Ghetto at the time in which the Warsaw Ghetto existed so we did uh, we were talking earlier we we're talking about primary sources uh he and, and his associate were engaged day in day out in uh creating establishing primary sources that would, that would document a history that was being at the same time erased by the perpetrators of the crimes so part of uh, the challenge that we're dealing with in, in in this period of history but maybe in general about the violations of human rights is that human rights are not only violated but they're violated by those who tend to hide their tracks, to hide the primary sources of their uh, crimes, their violations. Um, and so Emanuel Ringenbrug, but also political thinker Hannah Arendt, and all the way to filmmaker uh, Charlie Chaplin, and also followers, and among them uh, is um, the cartoonist uh, and graphic novelist Art Spiegelman, and more recently filmmaker Taika Waititi, uh, especially in how they engage uh, um, the the legacy of the Nazi regime and the persona, uh, the the visual persona of Adolf Hitler. This exhibition also strives to represent the singular clash between the miniature size of most of uh, Schick's artwork. I don't know where you're watching this from, but I can assure you that most of the artwork we'll be discussing is not much bigger than the screens you're watching from, or maybe even smaller. Typically, the size of what is today a a, a, a tablet. Uh, so we're talking about fairly small uh, works of art. And at the same time, the, the, there is a clash between this uh, miniature size and the magnitude of the themes that it confronted, that this art confronted. And so to do so, with students in my research group, we actually used and, and explored the 21st century competencies in terms of visual literacy and attention to detail by kind of deconstructing and reconstructing uh, a deep dive into the visual culture that emerges from, from the artwork of, of Arthur Schick. And so our ability to digitally crop and remix elements of Schick's multi-layered art and brought us and especially our students and now the public very close to the artist's techniques and also to the artist's mind or at least gaze. So a, a big component of the exhibition and that's not something we're going to play with today is actually that um, uh, with students, we created a data bank of images that were cropped from the original artwork, digitally cropped, and that are available to visitors to create their own artwork, their own cartoons, and to express themselves using the language and the syntax of, of the artist. Uh, with that being said, let me just give you a little guide into what the exhibition contains and some of the primary sources that it highlights. Uh, it actually starts with Arthur Schick at work and at work both in a self-portrait that you see on the left side of the screen. Uh, they're both, both of these portraits were made at the same time when Arthur Schick had recently arrived to New York City as a refugee from, from Europe. He had left Poland and France and the UK, arrived through Canada, arrived to, to the United, United States in 1940. And we see a portrait of himself drawing caricatures, uh, cartoons of, uh, if you look closely, and we've been invited to zoom in, but I don't know how closely you can see, but uh, these are, uh, these are uh, people, including a skeleton wearing, uh, wearing Nazi uniforms. Um, whereas Arthur Schick is also presenting himself as a soldier. He's echoing a way in which had been defined as a soldier in art, as, a, as I was saying, as, a, as, a, as an activist, as a, as a man of a human of action. 
uh, and his action was through his art, his artwork. And on the right, we see a, a, a photographic portrait of Arthur Schick at work in, in his studio on the Upper West Side in, uh, in New York City, 1942. And the photograph is by a fellow immigrant and refugee from Europe to the United States, Roman Vishniak, uh, who's who is in part a contemporary, they, they live for the first half of the century, century uh, and they live through very similar experiences. And, and, and Vishniak is very well known for documenting uh, Jewish communities in Central Eastern Europe on the, on the eve of the Holocaust, on the eve of their uh, destruction. Um, the reason the exhibition starts with this and why I'm, I'm also starting my presentation with this is that Arthur Schick actually tends to break the fourth wall of art and to put himself often into his artwork. And here you see a, an example of that. So again, in terms of zooming in, this is a dedicatory page of the um, uh, Passover Haggadah, the, the book read on the, on the evil Passover in Jewish homes uh, and uh, at the Passover Seder. But you see at the bottom right of the, of the dedication page that Arthur Schick puts himself into the picture, into the frame again, wearing a, a uniform, but also holding the weapons of his, uh, of his action, which are uh, a paintbrush and, and, and a color palette. Um, this is an invitation to look for the unexpected, to find uh, Arthur Schick himself into his work. Again, with the understanding that this is an artist that works at a time in which there was almost no alternative for artists. They had to be confronted with history and many artists diverted their careers and probably Arthur Schick did the same in order to, to weaponize their tools uh, for a broader fight for, for, for human rights and for democracy. Um, the fact that he has uh, um, fellow and companions and also Followers can be seen just by juxtaposing images. Again, this is another technique in learning is finding similarities between uh, different content. And so what you have on the left hand of, of the screen is you have Arthur Schick again himself at work uh, and out of his table, all of the monsters, all of the dictators and, and their allies and enablers are emerging from, uh, from the page, from, from the page on which he's, he's drawing and painting. And similarly, we see on the right, uh, this is a, just a frame from the graphic novel Mouse by, uh, by Arthur Spiegelman, by Arthur Spiegelman is, uh, is in which also history seems to spill, both haunt the, the, the drawing table of a cartoonist, again, a cartoonist and artist who's putting himself on the front line, on the front line of his own page. So who is not hiding, but who is in plain sight. And, uh, and who's confronting the reality, the overbearing reality and overwhelming reality of history in his artwork. Um, just as a, as a reminder, uh, the work that we did here, and that's what I was saying, in a way it's work that's educational at its core is thanks to a very, very important gift. We were able to acquire the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at the University of California, Berkeley, was uh, able to acquire a very, very important private collection of uh, the work that entirely dedicated to the work and life of Arthur Schick. And so this exhibition is kind of like a manifestation of the work we've done since acquiring the collection. What you don't see uh, here is, is all the work in processing and turning this, what was a private collection into a publicly accessible one. So a lot of what, uh, what you see and what I'm presenting is actually also directly accessible to all of you and your students online through the various channels of the Magnus. So, using the Magnus website is a way to, to dive deep into, into these primary sources and also into some context beyond that. Um, diving deep involves also letting students sort of roam free. So on the left-hand side, we'll get back to, the, to, the, to this uh, political cartoon uh, that uh, Arthur Schick titled Madness, uh, but uh, you see how Students uh, in cropping various elements also animated them. I think, yeah, it's it, the animation is continuing, but I'll, I'll bring you back just for a second so you, you see it a little bit more. Uh, so letting students kind of do deep diving, deep zooming, deep, deep learning and, and, and acquiring visual literacy by using tools that they're familiar with to create new ways to present uh, the artwork. 
And so what, again, to reiterate what I'm explaining today is also for you to see the university at work in a way, how, how a, a collection, a research collection of primary sources can be uh, leveraged to, to, to see, to, to, to um, experience the, the work of the university itself, the work of teaching and the results of teaching itself. So I was saying earlier that uh, a key aspect and a, an essential uh, element in the background of, of the work that Arthur Schick did and of the sources we're examining today is a very important realization. Uh, this is a quote from a, 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 for me, fundamental study of the emergence of global human rights out of the conversation of minority rights and especially Jewish minority rights in the, in the aftermath of World War I, a time of great upheaval, uh, a huge refugee crisis of redrawing maps of, of geopolitical maps of, of the world, of collapse of empires. Uh, not, not only populations are in movement, but many of them are refugees. They're stateless. They're not represented by anyone. And this is a time in which political thinkers, legal thinkers start, uh, start to conceive what will become in the aftermath of World War II will become what we call today global human rights. So in, in, in some ways, what, I'm, what we're discussing today is very much rooted in, uh, in this outlook, which is a broader intellectual, political, and legal outlook about the state of humankind in our times. Um, and another proof of concept of this was to work with students on timelines, on chronologies. And so what we created, and you see it on this map, you see in, uh, in uh, uh, black, so on the right, you see key dates in the establishment of the concept of global human rights in the modern uh, period, um, all the way to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in uh, Paris in 1948. And um, we see how these big dates are uh, also bracketing smaller dates on the left. And these are all the moments in which the um, European democracies collapse in the hand of variety of fascist regimes or movements and so on. And we see how in red, Arthur Schick's own biography is absolutely bracketed by these moments. So it's another way to visually contextualize not just history, but different histories and bringing them uh, together in the same uh, discourse. Um, a key moment in uh, Arthur Schick's production is his participation in a collective effort. It was a fairly politically ecumenical uh, effort that brought in people from various political persuasions at the moment in which what was happening in Eastern Europe at the hand of the Nazis became publicly known in Europe, across the world, and in America. So what you have here is this text that you see here is actually uh, a quote that's uh, on the wall of the, of the exhibition gallery. And it's from historian Emanuel Ringelblum, who I was talking about, uh, about whom was talking earlier, who was documenting what was happening in the Warsaw Ghetto as the Warsaw Ghetto was in place uh, in the 1940s, all the way to, to, the, to the uprising. And it's, these are the words from his diaries in which he presents um, what the measure of success was for those who were living, so essentially the victims of, of terrible human rights violations uh, in real time, what, what, what constituted for them a measure of success. These were people who had no hope of coming out of the war of the conflict alive and whose only goal was to make sure that the knowledge of what was happening would actually emerge and be uh, shared. So um, it's, this marks in, in 1942, the moment in which the BBC for the first time in a broadcast mentions what's going on in, in the ghetto and what's going on in Eastern Europe. Uh, as a consequence of that, um, Arthur Schick joined this group of intellectual artists, political activists, as I was saying, fairly ecumenical from various, uh, from various corners of the political spectrum. And this is uh, very important. And so in the spring of 43, he participated in a, in a shared effort to make what we now call the Holocaust, but what, that, what was at the time, time being denounced as the slaughter of European Jews, especially in Eastern Europe. 
uh, known to the American public. A goal was, of course, that of mobilizing the war machine of the United States to encourage the Allies to take direct military action against uh, against the Nazis, and more, speci more specifically, to protect the lives of those whose life were under constant threat. Um, I was saying this is a it's and it's interesting to go through the sources of this effort. This effort essentially culminated in a very large pageant with uh, thousands and thousands in attendance at Madison Square Garden in New York City, and then also the Hollywood Bowl in, in Los Angeles. Uh, that included speeches and theater and art and music. And you see at the bottom some of the names of people, of the people involved. Uh, and they range from, and probably the, the leading figure, the one who spent his uh, name and, and literary uh, skills to, to, to advocate for the cause of, 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 of Jews in Eastern Europe was Ben Echt, who was, uh, uh, who was a screenplay writer and very famous in Hollywood, especially as the as the writer of the script for for the movie uh, Stagecoach, and uh, but with them others all the way to Kurt Weil, who had recently immigrated and as a refugee from Nazi Germany, um, um, all participated in this effort in in various ways. And one can say that uh, Arthur Schick essentially uh, took on both the corporate identity of the project, but also took on the the graphic. Um, narration of what was going on in Eastern Europe. So what you see here is an example of that, but I will also use this example to encourage you to read, uh, so to, to, to dive into a deep reading of Arthur Schick's visual um, language. So in, on this page for a, a, a publication in 1943, um, uh, Arthur Schick illustrated a, a poem, The Ballad of the Doomed Jews of Europe, a poem by Ben Echt. And um, I invite you to look at this poem because uh, there are a couple of considerations that have to do with how to confront uh, Schick's artwork that I would like to point out for you. So first is that you can read the poem and the poem will be read left to right, top to bottom. So I just broke down the, the parts, the vi visually broke down the poem for you on this page. So from the, the top left, uh, the beginning of the poem to all the way to the bottom right, the end of the poem. Arthur Schick's visual work works in the opposite direction. And so one of the invitations here, and this is a good case study, but it's an invitation in approaching pretty much all of Schick's work is to um, understand how a page is visually organized and uh, Arthur Schick tends to be very narrative. He has a need to be narrative because he's telling stories. He's trying to tell history through his stories. And so he needs to be narrative, but his narratives work in their own uh, visual way. So in this case, whereas the, the text of the poem goes from top to bottom and from left to right, the visual narrative begins at the bottom right of the page and continues all the way up to the top right. So it has an almost circular move movement uh, to tell a story. What is the story? The story as we see it at the bottom right is uh, Nazi soldiers threatening Jews. These, these people are identifiably Jewish because of their, let's say the school cap on, 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 a, on this elderly man, other dress codes of Jewish women in Europe at the time but also the holding of a Torah scroll uh, according to, to the canons of, of East European Jewish uh, material culture. Uh, they are threatened and somebody is making a phone call. So a way to follow this narrative is to actually follow the phone line across the narrative. So if we continue up and we see that the phone line, the cable is going all the way and goes all the way to the United Nations, and you see it goes through a switchboard and there are all kinds of details across the, uh, across the, the path that leads to the United Nations. And we also see how the United Nations are asleep and not responding. And, um, and the narrative concludes with the four freedoms uh, declared by President Roosevelt in 1941. Uh, being set to music by that's played by both an angel and, and a skeleton playing a cello. So the, the, the commentary are on what the 
the plausible future of the four freedoms and the commentary on the role of the United Nations in, in this case, not protecting, not being responsive to uh, the plight of um, victims of human rights violations is uh, pretty clear in the narrative, but only if the narrative is reconstructed and read as its own visual narrative that can be independent from the verbal narrative of a text. So the invitation here is to look at these sources and learn how they work by looking very, very closely at them. And we'll continue to do that. And here is another example of that. Uh, and and um, the presentation before mine already pre uh, included this work. Um, but um, things to point out here are the, to begin with, are the uh, prominent role of the, of the words uh, at the at the top of the of the page, and the fact that um, the quotations are both biblical, but one is in English, Cain, where is thy, uh, thy brother, is uh, where is able thy brother in in English, and above that, in a way as a as a form of title or exergo for for this uh, for this work, is uh, are the words de profundis. The profundis are the beginning words of the Latin version of Psalm 150. Um, in Hebrew, they would be mi ma makim, and it's uh, more than telling that uh, Arthur Schick chooses Latin over Hebrew to uh, to um, print this text on on his page. This was a for a cartoon to be published in in February of 1943 in the Chicago Sun. Um, it's essentially a visual meditation on what was happening at that point or what was known about what was happening at that point in Eastern Europe. And it's a visual meditation that speaks to the broader common denominator and brings in the Jewish roots of Christianity and addresses mostly a, a predominantly Christian uh, public and society. So uh, Jesus Christ, which we see uh, at the top of the heap of bodies, a heap of victims, is also a victim and is a victim who's holding the Tablets of the law. This is a fairly standard representation of the tablets of the law and with the acronyms for the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. So there is a, 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 a Christ who's brought back to the Judaic roots of Christianity and a text that does the same. And we see it also in the most minute details. Here is a, is a close up of that. So we have. Christ holding the tablet of the laws next to a religious Jew. Again, we see the, the skull cap as a, as a signifier of adherence to traditional religious practice and the holding of a Torah scroll. So we have both the Ten Commandments and a Torah scroll uh, in, in the hands of these uh, Jewish Christian victims of what will be known but was not known at that time as the Holocaust. Furthermore, if we go even deeper, we see that the details are painstaking in terms of representing the victims. So the victims in their loss of humanities are actually highly humanized. In the background, we see more victims and pile of bodies along with piles of, of rubble and the destruction of land and landscape, not just the destruction of people caused by war. But I would say the more important is if we go even deeper, so we really have to zoom in and in and in, uh, just as a reminder, the galleries also have on an iPad that's projected on a large surface, uh, have the entire uh, Arthurship collection at the Magnus, including this artwork and, of course, all the works in the exhibitions on an iPad. So, in, in, And they were digitized in very high resolution so they can be expanded. And this the work that I am doing with you, breaking it up in, uh, in slides for my presentation, is can actually be done literally in real time by uh, viewers in the gallery. So again, thinking about working with students, I would I would highly uh, recommend getting hold of images. Many of these are can can be downloaded from from the web and invite students to zoom in and to look for details and catch all the details that can be caught. So from the skeleton here, which is actually memento mori and has a whole iconographic position, all the way to a reference to Job which is not just a reference to the book of Job, the biblical book of Job, and therefore the suffering of uh, this, this biblical paradigm of suffering, human suffering uh, in Job, but also the words, the invocation, which are, which become the invocations, the inv words of invocation of Christ on the cross. Uh, so again, pointing to 
a commonality in the tradition and a, in in the in the Judeo-Christian Jew, Jew, tradition through this work. All of this can only be done by zeroing in, by zooming in, by going very deep into the visual language of the artist. Uh, so visual literacy is essential to exploring these sources. And you see, we, we also saw this earlier, and it's interesting that we, we actually went from some, from, we didn't coordinate this, but we went for some of this of sim similar uh, visual examples. Uh, what's interesting about this cartoon is also how the artist um, repurposes work for various uh, goals. So on the one hand, and this is the larger cartoon, we already analyzed it together earlier, uh, but this was uh, uh, drawn in 1943, but was also used only in its detail of the two uh, child refugees. Uh, it was also used uh, as a in, in a pamphlet. This was a pamphlet with stamps to sell stamps to to raise money uh, to uh, to organize uh, support uh, emergency support for victims of of the Nazis in uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, one of the in interesting and relevant things to bring forth about Arthur Schick is how he was also very aware of the marketing power of visual art. And so one can see his, uh, his production of cartoons and of um, corporate identity, et cetera, as a way to leverage that power in real time. And it's not uh, far-fetched to say that a lot of his work is comparable to the Instagram or TikToks of today. It has that same kind of immediacy, that same kind of, uh, of real-time response to, uh, to what happens in the world. Um, part of the secret of this artist's work is also a very close adherence to history. So what one can do, and this may be for advanced students, but is actually looking at the iconography he created to document. So we're later in, the, in 1943 to document the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. He did so in, in, in several works. These are two of them. And what we can do with these works is actually really look at the characters because many of the characters here can be identified as actual historical figures, actual people who fought in the Warsaw Ghetto at the time. And so uh, it's, let's say, it's, it's, it's more than, a, than an exercise to try and match um, these figures with uh, contemporary photographs and other documents that, in, in, you know, that qualify more as historical document than art, but that uh, essentially communicate the same uh, type of visual content and uh, indicate how much Arthur Schick in producing these works was trying to represent history more than art. And essentially historical narrative and the call to action was uh, was the, the common thread and the, the dominant feature of his production at this at this point at this juncture. Um, I would like to to continue and, and close my presentation, but I also think together with you about how Arthur Schick represents Hitler. So again, in the exhibition, uh, um, I included two quotes from the autobiography of Charlie Chaplin that have to do with uh, his making of The Great Dictator. Uh, and earlier in his autobiography, he talks about the time in which uh, The Great Dictator was being produced and the concerns on the part of distribution houses. Uh, in uh, in across the world in in distributing this this film because it was of course very very highly critical of the Nazis and especially took aim and satirical aim at uh, at uh, uh, Adolf Hitler and uh, but the concern at the time was that uh, the opposition and the the allies of Hitler and 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 uh, would would be too vocal and oppose this movie and so there was caution about that and at that point Charlie Chaplin says I pushed for this movie because Hitler must be laughed at. Um, and here is uh, Arthur Schick, and we see how connected his depictions are to chaplains. So here's just a quick clip from The Great Dictator, just to remind you, and we see very similar, we're talking about work done at the same time, and we see a very uh, compatible demeanor in both visual characters. And of course, 
the reference to the globe that we find in both works. Um, but the same tropes are also found, and again, in speaking about, uh, you know, about this with uh, with younger students, younger than the students I teach at, uh, at the university level, um, a recent movie like Jojo Rabbit also brings forth similar, uh, similar characters. So here is again a I am clip. beginning to question your loyalty to myself and the party. You call yourself a patriot? And, and it's on. And essentially what Taika Waititi, uh, a filmmaker and actor, who is most likely very familiar to students in the K-12 world, is also because of his work on, on, on superheroes. So a household name for younger generations, this is how he depicts Adolf Hitler in ways that are very uh, coherent with the tradition established by Chaplin and Arthur Schick. Uh, let me see if I can move past this slide. And uh, the exhibition also includes Again, as a primary source, but not an art primary source, uh, another quotation from uh, from Charlie Chaplin's autobiography, in which he actually expresses concerns about uh, whether satire is the most appropriate uh, tool for uh, exposing uh, crimes such as the crimes of of the Nazis. Um, and here is another example of satire. I uh, felt. Uh, somewhat entitled in uh, in including this depiction of Benito Mussolini as uh, with his pants down and with his uh, with his uh, uh, behind exposed um, for two reasons. One is that I'm myself from Italy and I you know this is the country that actually prototyped fascism for the rest of the world. And so it's good to be reminded of that. Uh, but the other is actually that this although this is somewhat funny and 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 often draws a, a smile, if not a laugh on the viewers, to remind that this is actually not funny at all, and that uh, this type of set, satire comes at a cost and is an often a necessary tool. Um, why a necessary tool? Because it's part of a broader project, and this is, these are really my last my last uh, words today. Um, part of a broader project to actually study the enemy, study the criminal, study the human rights uh, violator and going very, very deep into their knowledge, into their cultures, into their mythologies, so that all of these can be exposed. So essentially by diving deeply into the work of Arthur Schick, we also learn techniques that are helpful almost at this point to our everyday life in terms of understanding how mass communication works and how propaganda works and how uh, crimes are often hidden from plain, from from plain sight, from from the public eye. So here is, for example, a study of Nazi mythologies that brings together um, the Valhalla, the, the the Nordic mythology, the music of Richard Wagner. Uh, so it's some kind of like a multimedia piece, and of course historical figures of the time uh, in which it is produced. So we see all of the usual su suspects: Adolf Hitler and Goebbels and 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 uh, and Goering. Etc. and all of their allies, including in the kitchen. Of course, the Frenchman needs to be in the kitchen, but the Frenchman is Marshal Petain, uh, as in as in the French ally and collaborationist uh, head of collaborationist government uh, of of France during during the Second World War. So, what uh, a way an invitation is to actually study also these types of works very deeply and to be invited to explore as deeply as we explore the denunciations of violations of human rights, also the descriptions of how violators work, how they think, what their culture is about. In other words, know your enemy, know your enemy's proclivities in deep detail so that you can uh, formulate not only critical thinking, but critical and, uh, and effective action. Um, and here are more details of this of this work and you see how deep you can go you see how the works of heine german jewish uh, author are stomped upon uh, by by these characters how again we have a, a a religiously observant jew we see the skull cap used as a as a bear skin uh, to furnish the floor of the of the room um, 
it's work that's not shy in exposing violence and in exposing violent and demeaning behaviors. And that's also part of how to be conscious in engaging students around these topics and sensibilities around these topics. So going deeply into this is important, but it's also uh, important to, to review this as a wake up call. I'm not gonna play this video. I don't think the gentleman deserves it, but uh, this is a reminder that I, I, as I was uh, adding the final touches to uh, the exhibition that debuted in Berkeley in, uh, in January of uh, 2020, um, and going deep into um, the, the, let's say the work, I'm sorry, the work of uh, Josef uh, Goepels, which we see the, who we see depicted on the right-hand side of that uh, drawing that I, I showed you and dove deep into until now. At the same time, the minister was essentially the minister of culture for uh, the former government, the Bolsonaro government of Brazil, went public with a speech about Brazilian culture that quoted word for word the words of Josef Goebbels, of, of a, one of the leaders of the Nazi uh, regime of the time. In other words, the real times of Arthur Schick are also the real times of our days. And the invitation to dive deep into images is not just an invitation to appreciate primary sources for the sake of primary sources, but also to appreciate the call to action that this type of work um, elicits. Thank you very, very much. Maybe I will stop sharing my screen and um, hopefully uh, I was um, audible by everyone uh, to this point. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to either, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can have a little bit of hand-holding here, but if there are questions or anything, of course, I'm happy to, to hear that and uh, otherwise happy to just let you flow into your next part of the program. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. It was uh, wonderful to, to hear your expertise on Arthur Schick and his artwork and um, it paired beautifully with, with Dory's presentation, even though you, you two didn't work together. Um, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we are going to dive into the next and last part of uh, this virtual program. Um, let's see if I can get my slide up. There we go. Um, so we are going to move into breakout rooms. Um, and so really what I hope for this part of um, the webinar is that we're able to take what Dory presented on and what Francesco uh, presented on um, and then talk with other teachers and colleagues to really figure out how we can apply his artwork uh, and this content into our classrooms practically. And so what we're going to do is everyone is going to be broken out into three different breakout rooms. So there'll be about eight to 10 people in your group. Uh, and you'll have 10 minutes and three different breakout rooms. Each of the breakout rooms are going to focus on a different theme of Arthur Schick's work. Uh, so dictators at work, resistance, and refugee experiences. I'll be leading one of the breakout rooms. And then I have two colleagues on the call, Rob Wallace, who is our STEM teacher program specialist and our director of education, Toya Williams, who will be leading the other two breakout rooms. And so at the 10 minute mark, uh, the three of us will be switching to a new group so that you will um, have a conversation about each of these three themes. Um, and in each of these breakout rooms, we'll be diving into the following questions um, with each other. Which pieces of art might you use in your classroom and why? How would you use this piece of art in your classroom? And could you adapt a current lesson plan to incorporate Schick's art as a primary source? And so you'll have a new set of eight to 10 Arthur Schick pieces in each breakout room um, to sort of dive into these questions with. Uh, and so, you know, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you can obviously unmute for these breakout rooms, but just make sure that we're being, you know, respectful of each other's opinions uh, during this discussions as well. Former classroom teacher, so I always feel like I have to, you know, maybe go a little bit too much with the with the instructions. But with that, uh, I'm gonna have our distance learning specialist, Maddie, uh, start the breakout rooms.
Hello, everyone that's still in the main meeting room. Uh, we have opened our breakout rooms. If you need any help getting into yours, please let me know and I can assign you into your breakout room. But we are moving into those into small groups to do some discussion. So just let me know if you need any help with that.
Okay, so it looks uh, my second laptop on was getting lots of feedback. Sorry about that. Um, so it looks like most everyone is back from the breakout sessions. I know I had a lot of really awesome conversations with uh, teachers in the breakout sessions, and I hope that you guys found that helpful. It's the first time that we're trying that with uh, a teacher webinar. So hopefully that was uh, a useful uh, part of your time. Um, but I am going to move into wrap up just to be mindful of y'all's time and how busy you are as as teachers. Um, and so uh, just to wrap up, uh, I do want to give you guys links to resources from our uh, webinar today. So uh, if you want resources specifically from this webinar, uh, you can scan that QR code or uh, we're putting a link in the chat box, just a wakelet, uh, so it'll give you access to all of the slides from today, all of the materials from the breakout rooms. I'll be posting the re webinar recording on there, um, and then we also have some additional uh, resources on there, too, from uh, our museum, the National World War II Museum, as well as ICS. Um, and then beyond that, that's also where you can find the certificate of completion for this professional development and a signed letter uh, as well uh, on that wakelet. So all the webinar resources uh, are on this wakelet. You can grab it from the QR code or from the chat box, um, but uh, I'll also be sending it in the follow-up email as well. I see someone in the chat box asking about summer teacher workshops. Um, so that is my next slide. Um, so just a little bit more about some of the additional resources at the National World War II Museum. Um, we regularly offer these teacher webinars where you can get a certificate of completion for uh, PD hours completed with us. Um, but we also offer student webinars. Uh, so our next one is in just a couple of weeks, uh, and it's about the 6888. Uh, Postal Division, which is one of the uh, few all African American women uh, divisions in the US military during World War II. It's going to be amazing. So, if you want your students to learn about that, uh, check out that student webinar. Um, but we also offer in person teacher professional development as well. Uh, so, Stacy was asking about those summer teacher workshops. Uh, we offer two different uh, summer workshops for teachers every summer um, that are fully paid for. So, uh, when you sign up and apply for that, uh, your plane ticket to New Orleans is covered, your lodging and most of your meals are covered for that week. So this summer, the first week is going to be about the war in Europe with a focus on our oral history collection. And then the second week is going to have a focus on the home front with a specific look at Hollywood. Uh, we have the Disney Goes to War exhibit on display this July. And so we'll be looking at media literacy, um, the role that Hollywood played in entertainment and propaganda during World War II on the home front, all of that good stuff for that second week. Uh, so if you're interested in any of these additional resources, you can scan that QR code or we'll also be putting that uh, link in the chat box. And again, it'll be in a follow up email um, that has links to all of our different resources, including the application for our um, summer uh, workshops this summer as well. Um, uh, so I see Gabrielle's asking if there's any requirements to apply or attend. Uh, so we encourage people to apply if they have at least two years of teaching experience, but we've also accepted people with less than that. Um, mostly we just want you to be in the classroom and planning to be in the classroom for the next academic school year. And then after you attend, uh, we ask that you facilitate your own professional development workshop with your uh, community back home based off of the resources during that workshop. Um, but the application is pretty short. I think there's two or three short answers and then just one letter of recommendation. Um, but yeah, please, uh, please apply. Um, that's a great program is how I got involved in the World War II Museum I attended. The summer workshop before I ended up getting a job here uh, and it was an amazing experience just like Lois said. Um, so yeah feel free uh, to check out all of our resources from that link tree link or from the QR code uh, and then the very last thing is that uh, if you have a moment tonight or tomorrow please 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 complete a survey for this webinar. Um, 
This is the first time that we kind of tried a longer format for our teacher online PD uh, that we tried out breakout rooms. And so we would really love to uh, hear your feedback, uh, hear what you want from these kinds of virtual workshops for teachers. Um, so feel free to go ahead and complete that as soon as we end the webinar um, or to do it tomorrow. I'll be sending it out in a follow-up email tomorrow as well, along with all of the other resources that we've talked about. Um, you'll get my email when I send the follow-up email, but um, uh, you can find my email in the chat box as well if you want to reach out to me about any questions about summer teacher workshops or curriculum, upcoming uh, programs. Uh, my job is to help teachers and to serve you guys. We know how hard it is to be in the classroom. Rob, Toya, and I are all former teachers, so we really just want to provide programs and resources that help you guys teach and do your jobs as awesome as you can. Um, so I know that this was a long uh, PD. Uh, I'll be sending out the certificate of completion and letter uh, tomorrow, but it's also on that wakelet uh, if you grab that link earlier. Thank you guys so much for, for coming and I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Thank you all for a great evening. Yeah, of taught, course. I taught all day. I was on my computer, I do online tutoring for a national company. So it's awesome. with individual students from 8 to 4.30 and then 5 o'clock to 7. This was a wonderful end to the day. Oh, awesome. Thank I'm you, so, glad yes. thank you so much. It's thank worth every you. minute. Oh, awesome. That's so good to hear. Yeah, uh, thank you. Have a great rest of your night. And I thank hope you. you don't set up the computer Good to see you tonight. again, Rob. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you guys so much.